This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. A narcotics powerhouse that runs like a Fortune 500 company. All we do is get money. Once this cocaine epidemic came in, it, it, it turned everything around. Yeah, GDP. I was like, you know, man, I'm just going to get filthy rich. Get money right now, I'll see. The Gangster Disciples made millions by brutally punishing anyone who got in their way. Either roll with the gang or they would roll over you. They dominated the drug trade in cities across the Midwest. It's like a cancer, it spreads. You got Gangster Disciples on every street corner. Not since the days of Capone has a Chicago gang ruled with such bloodlust. They only had one or two objectives to sell drugs or hurt people. They will assault you, beat you, shoot you, threaten your family, threaten your children. This is a joke. The more fear, you know, the more respect. Oh, yes. <laughs> Torture, dismemberment, murder. It's strictly business for the GDs. It's like that. It's real out here, man. Their simple goal, more money and more power. So Their idea was you live fast and die young and have a good looking corpse. You see this heat? I think I got a million of these. Two members of the Gangster Disciples slipped inside an after-hours club on the city's north side. 21-year-old Stan Cole led the way down to the basement, carrying a brown paper bag filled with almost $23,000 in cash. They were there to score a kilo of coke and believed they were on friendly turf. They were wrong. It was like a drug deal go bad. Next thing you know, I remember a gun going off, and I'm looking, looking to see who was the victim. Cole glanced down at his stomach to find himself bleeding. The shock and the trauma, it just hits your body. It's like, like, like a, a sledgehammer. Boom, your ears start ringing, and your balance is thrown off. It, things start to slow down. With the bullet lodged near his spine, Cole felt himself going numb. His friend grabbed him and dragged him outside to their car. Once you get shot, you're not going to feel a thing. But, but once that bullet decided to cool, uh, cool down inside of you, that's when the, a hell of a lot of pain starts to come. As they sped to the hospital, Cole knew he was in serious trouble. I lost a lot of blood. The smell of the blood is, is, is trauma enough because it smells like death. Nothing speaks louder than bullets and Benjamins in the gangster underworld. And no other gang in Chicago, Milwaukee, or Detroit earns more cash than the Gangster Disciples, one of the most powerful crime organizations in the Midwest. The GDs built a drug empire that, at its height, racked up more than $100 million a year. They call Chicago their birthplace, and their founder, Larry Hoover, the chairman. This former GD, who we'll call Q, is currently behind bars on a weapons charge. Q said Hoover wanted to control not only Chicago's drug traffic, but also legitimate businesses. Larry had a little philosophy. Why carry a gun when you can carry a briefcase? Why wear a hat when you can wear a suit and tie? He was ultimately trying to turn us all into businessmen. For 25 years, Hoover ruled his organization like a dictator and the Gangster Disciples swelled to 30,000 members. 
He established a rigid chain of command and punished anyone who disobeyed his orders. The discipline within the gang and the violence that occurred within the gang was as great as the, as the violence they perpetrated on their rival gangs. Violence and intimidation in the in the GDs was was essential for survival of the gang. The GDs' discipline, combined with the booming cocaine trade in the 1980s, vaulted them to power over their Chicago rivals, like the Vice Lords and the Mickey Cobras. They were probably the strongest, fastest growing uh, gang that I ever encountered. Their numbers just were astronomical. The GDs recruited most of their young soldiers from the city's public housing projects, where gang life often provided easy cash. Money is scarce, so when they're putting food on your table, you know, that's kind of big. You'll show loyalty to this person because he's making sure that you eat, you know what I'm saying? Q says he worked as a shooter for the GDs when they battled their rivals for drug turf at the Cabrini Green housing projects. For every person you shot, you get points, you know, and points added up to respect in the neighborhood and um, ultimately leadership position, you know. Q claims he got hooked on shooting the first time he pulled a trigger at age 12. After that first shot, you off to the races from there. Because it's like it builds up this euphoria in your brain. Now you geeked and you charged and it's a hot. Because every gang wanted to expand its territory, places like Cabrini Green turned into war zones, torn apart by sniper fire. Every day, it was a constant tug of war over area. And the only way that you can keep somebody at bay is to keep applying pressure every day. And that's what I specialize in, applying pressure to them every day. Q employed many different strategies for stalking his prey. He would eventually gain notoriety as one of the deadliest and most prolific shooters at Cabrini. I would go out early in the morning on a hunt is what I called it. And I would go into the rival gang's building like seven in the morning. You might be able to catch somebody down there selling drugs or whatever, you know, been out all night, catch them drowsy, slipping, and you get them. I would stake out areas. I would sit in bushes for hours, you know, in the rain, sleet, snow. I was willing to do whatever it took to get to my enemy. As the GDs established footholds on Chicago's north, west, and south sides, they drew more and more heat from the police. So they set their sights on untapped drug markets in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, and Indiana. The gangster disciples definitely, you know, were, were looking to branch out and definitely did branch out to other cities. And they would send individuals you know, from Chicago to go to set up an operation into other areas, other cities. One of those other cities was Milwaukee, a straight shot north of Chicago, 90 miles up the interstate. There, the gangster disciples found dozens of small-time local gangs eager to join the GD banner. The gang found it easy to recruit new members and set up new cliques. I was introduced to a lot of little new jack GDs, as I call them, in Milwaukee. They think this is something y'all been doing for years, and I want to be a part of it. I like the fancy cars. Interior, dead down. I like the jewelry. I like all the women that y'all got. I'm a monster. Everybody wants to be a part of the clique, and it just spreads like cancer. As the gangster disciples spread out from Chicago, they became known as public enemy number one. You did. You come through this bitch, you get a walk, you did. Their unmatched success was driven by multi-million dollar drug sales and brute force. They were ruthless. There was total disregard for human life. Whatever it took to make money. Sound up. Sound up.
In the 1980s, the gangster disciples spread out across the Midwest, cashing in on a multi-million dollar drug market through numbers and violence. This gang powerhouse had started more modestly, when in 1966, gangster David Barksdale founded the Black Disciples on Chicago's South Side. The Disciples were a small but lucrative drug ring. Barksdale controlled the gang and his neighborhood until his death in 1974. His passing created a power vacuum on the streets. Larry King Hoover stepped in to fill that void, launching a splinter group called the Gangster Disciples. Hoover wanted to create a black gang that would rival the Italian mafia in wealth and power. Like any organization, you need a leader. And Larry Hoover, you know, had this vision for the Gangster Disciples, and they followed it. Hoover modeled the GDs like a big corporation. He appointed himself chairman and set up a board of directors inside the pen and another one on the streets. The fact that Hoover was serving life at a state prison in Dixon, Illinois, did little to thwart his ambitions. Larry Hoover was very, very sharp in terms of flying under the radar. He didn't walk around flying colors. He didn't walk around flashing signs. He was very uh, low-keyed in his presence. Hoover took advantage of the state prison's liberal rules to hold scores of meetings with gang members over the phone and in the visitation room. There were certain board members that could meet with him, and he would give direction as to what he wanted done. The board members would, would listen to him and carry out his orders. These GD leaders passed orders down to foot soldiers, who then carried out the gang's business on the streets. He had developed his organization to a point where he had several layers that made it very difficult to ever implicate him on anything. In 1978, Hoover solidified his power base behind bars. He convinced black, white, and Latino prison gangs to unite under one banner while serving time. The Alliance gave them unprecedented control. Hoover called it the Folks Nation. Hoover got them together and made all of them drop the flags that they were with and become just one game. With his power inside cemented, Hoover flexed his muscle on the streets. He imposed a tax on all drug sales made on GD turf. In exchange for the right to sling dope, dealers had to share 70% of their earnings with the GD leadership. Hoover's enforcers made sure that everyone paid up. We had to pay dues, you know what I'm saying? Every week they said that this money was gonna be used to buy guns, clothing, pay rents, lawyers, things of that nature. In the late 1980s, the explosive rise of crack cocaine transformed Hoover's organization into a drug empire. The GDs amassed yearly profits in the tens of millions of dollars but they always wanted more, snatching up drug turf from rival gangs. That's why there was so much violence, because they tried to acquire as much territory as they could in order to sell the narcotics and generate more revenue. The GDs quickly expanded beyond Chicago, reaching their tentacles into other Midwestern cities like Milwaukee. There, they found the perfect breeding ground for a new generation of recruits. There was a huge portion of the population that was disenfranchised. There were serious poverty issues. Corresponding with that, you started to see increased drug traffic, increased gang activity. Once a major manufacturing hub, the city suffered an economic downturn in the 1980s as factories closed or moved overseas. 
nearly 100,000 jobs vanished, leaving families without any income. The black community on the north side was hit especially hard. As a result, the kids, they were out on the street, they went to the corners, they went to their friends. Gang affiliation started to develop. Neighborhood gangs popped up, terrorizing residents with armed robberies, muggings, and beatings. But that was only the beginning. What eventually transpired next is uh, an influx of the organized uh, street gangs from Chicago. The kids themselves that were from the Milwaukee area kind of looked up and idolized. More of a harder core individual from the gang in Chicago. We wanted to be a lot like guys from Chicago. You know, that was a huge influence on us because uh, they were so far along in their gang lifestyle. Larry Hooper capitalized on the situation. From prison, he dispatched his Chicago field marshals north to recruit and unite local gangs under the GD banner. These newly minted crews quickly adopted the brutal gang culture. Dane County, Wisconsin, February 1991. We've got an actual crime scene out here, okay? We've got a female, badly beaten, and partially decomposed. Been here for quite some time. Doris Ann McLeod, a 16-year-old from Illinois, paid a steep price for associating with the GDs. Police recovered her body in a wildlife preserve 70 miles west of Milwaukee. She had massive trauma uh, to her sternum area, massive trauma under her neck and to her chin, and there was a puncture injury to her throat, which was the likely cause of death. McLeod's killer had also raped her and chopped off her hands. Police investigators learned that McLeod was a runaway who had recently hooked up with a 26-year-old gangster disciple named Joseph White. White had started up a new GD clique in Milwaukee. Police say he had recruited the teenager to work for the gang as a prostitute. Joe was going to be the head of this clique, and Doris was going to be his D-queen. He bragged about the fact that he had the snow bunny, meaning a young white girl that he felt he could make a lot of money with. She had the responsibility for um, making money for prostituting herself and having sex with other gang members. Police suspected White was involved in her slaying. As we began to interview, people would refer to Joe as most, or the most, most standing for Minister of Severe Torture. When detectives searched White's house for evidence, they discovered a handwritten book of GD rules. According to those rules, anyone who disobeyed the gang would receive, quote, 50 to the chest, a punishment that appeared to match Doris McLeod's injuries. And that certainly was consistent with the trauma that we saw on Doris. Her whole upper chest plate was involved in that type of beating. A repeated blunt force blows, whether she's struck with a fist or struck with some type of an object. Joe White's three-year-old son, Joseph Jr., revealed another important clue to police. He said a monster had hurt a woman named Dee in the basement. Police showed him a photo of Doris McLeod, and he told them that was Dee. Did she live here with you? Yeah. In this house? The monster hurt Dee, Joe? Yes. Where did he hurt Dee? No, What did he do to Dee? Huh? Uh-huh. Cut her? Yeah. Where did he cut Dee? Here? Uh-huh, baby. Under where? Uh-huh, baby. Under finger? You're looking at this three-year-old kid telling us that the monster had done something to Dee talking about seeing her fingers bleeding, seeing her crying that his dad was there. We couldn't make that up. Police believed the boy's father, Joe White, was in fact the monster. 
and that White had made an example of McLeod after she violated one of his GD rules. Dory was his message. Dory was his poster child. He has to have people know that when she disobeyed, she got 50 to the chest. Police arrested White and eventually charged him with first-degree murder. In 1994, White was found guilty and sentenced to 80 years in prison. The GD style justice doled out to McLeod was part of a wave of gang crime crossing the Midwest. In Milwaukee, the murder rate reached an all time high, more than quadrupling from 1984 to 1991, as more and more gangsters staked out their turf. Many of them uh, were suspected of homicides, uh, brutal beatings. Uh, many of them uh, ended up actually dead themselves, you know. Many of them would just as soon kill you than speak with you. GD to the world go up. Hey, free Larry Hoover here. During the 1980s and 1990s, the gangster disciples spread from one Midwestern city to the next. They spilled blood in the streets from Chicago to Milwaukee, Minneapolis to Detroit, Indianapolis to Des Moines. Authorities learned to identify them by their universal symbols. A six-pointed Star of David and a three-pointed Devil's Pitchfork. We start seeing the six-pointed star tattoos, the pitchfork placed in an upright fashion, and the letters GD would also be incorporated into the tattoo itself. According to the GD's founder, Larry Hoover, each point on the Star of David represents one of the gang's core beliefs. Love, life, loyalty, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. The GDs have other ways of identifying themselves, from brandishing black and blue colors to signing to the right. That means cocking their hats to the right, crossing their arms to the right, or rolling up their right pant legs. And they use hand signals and handshakes to tell friend from foe. When you approach someone with a handshake and he said that he was a part of your gang, as soon as you shake his hand, he know what fingers to throw up to you, which fingers to intertwine with other fingers. And if he didn't know that, then he could be jumped up immediately. The GD school themselves in the gang's constitution and 16 codes of conduct, written by the chairman, Larry Hoover. These codes shape every aspect of how they live and work. First one was silence and secrecy. That's where you didn't talk to no non-members about organization business, period. The chairman came up with a little saying, which was, if the duck wouldn't have quacked, he wouldn't have wind up on the hunter's dinner table. It's your mouth that gets you in trouble. Other rules forbid GD members from using drugs, showing disrespect, and drawing the attention of the police. The GDs enforce a variety of punishments for those who break the rules, from fines to beatings to death. There's accountability in every walk of life, particularly in gangs, there's a lot of accountability. They had what was called pumpkin heads. There was uh, torture of individuals where they would uh, take them into the basement of a building, uh, heat a curling iron, and burn the individual, and then pour salt onto the burn. By the early 1990s, the frequency and brutality of gangland crime stirred up federal law enforcement. Agents from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms joined forces with the Chicago Police Department to wage a massive sting operation against the GDs. It's time to take them off. It's time to stop the violence. 
Authorities took aim at the upper echelons of the gang, including Chairman Larry Hoover, in the hope of crippling the GD's multi-million dollar drug empire. By wiretapping Hoover's frequent phone calls from state prison, the feds discovered that he was laundering drug money through business fronts like nightclubs and rap concert promoters. On the wiretaps, we would get information, uh, you know, of his orders. We were able to show that he was still involved with uh, activities of the gang, even though he was incarcerated. August 31st, 1995. Federal authorities indicted Larry Hoover and 38 of his top GD associates. The charges included racketeering, drug trafficking, and extortion. Hoover was convicted and sentenced to life in federal prison. His new home, the Supermax facility in Florence, Colorado, where unlike state prison, Hoover could no longer see visitors or make phone calls. He was effectively cut off from the GDs. Many of his associates back in Chicago were also convicted and sent to prison. It dismantled their, their hierarchy. It took their leaders away. The organization for some time was, was in disarray and nobody really wanted to be the leader or say they were the leader because they saw what had happened to the previous leaders. But the GDs weren't finished yet. Many of their sets began operating and flourishing independently. For that reason, they became all the more dangerous. These sets didn't have to answer to anyone. Well, what's hard to deal with is that there's going to be so many splinter groups, and that's going to create turmoil, which is going to create more violence. One of the most dangerous GD sets started in the late 1990s when a pair of gangsters moved to Milwaukee from Chicago. Two brothers, Antoine and Akila Crittenden, created a set called The Murder Mob and terrorized the city's poorest neighborhoods. Metcalf Park, a 15-block area on the north side, is today nicknamed Ghost Town. You can drive through that area, and even I do it now, and I'll be like, oh, that's where so-and-so died, and that's where so-and-so got murdered. That's why they call it Ghost Town, right? And you start to mark areas of town by, like, who got murdered. The murder mob set up shop in the heart of Ghost Town and shook down local drug pushers for their cash. Their MO was that they would murder other drug dealers to get their money. And you know, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. The mere mention of the murder mob, uh, even amongst uh, criminals on the street, drew a lot of respect. The murder mob soon formed an alliance with another GD crew called the Ghetto Boys. The Ghetto Boys were the most feared because of the level of violence that they were willing to commit uh, at any point in time. Jerry Versi and Joel Dolo Rhodes led the GD set of the Ghetto Boys on the city's north side. This is the, the neighborhood that the uh, Ghetto Boys were located in. Uh, they had active dope houses running up in this neighborhood. The Ghetto Boys followed the GD code by meeting out savage beatings to their own members who disobeyed gang rules. They termed it Rec time, R-E-C. When you made a mistake in the commission of a, of a crime, someone would indicate that it was rec time and you would be beaten. It was a way of keeping internal discipline within the gang. Like the murder mob, the ghetto boys also robbed coke dealers for their cash and drugs. In the summer of 2001, they put the squeeze on a dealer named Charnel Hicks. Where we're at right now is on 33rd and Center. This is the crime scene location for the uh, Charnel Hicks uh, kidnapping. On August 7th, Joel Dolo Rhodes and five other GD members forced Hicks inside a car wash they owned in Metcalf Park. First, they stripped him naked, tied him to a chair, 
Joel Rhodes instructed them to put a motorcycle helmet over the head of Charnell Hicks. The thugs ordered Hicks to tell them where he was hiding his dope. When Hicks refused to sing, they clubbed him with a baseball bat and burned him with cigarettes. The victim was then shot in the foot. The victim was in immense pain. Then, all but one of the gang members, Charles Bishop, left the car wash. Bishop dozed off, and Hicks seized the chance to untie himself and escape. It was brutal. Uh, if you saw the pictures of the victim, it was pretty bad. Bishop would eventually pay the price for his negligence. Three ghetto boys were ordered to beat him. It was wreck time, once again. There's a punishment meted out if you screw up. And that's the difference with gang members. Gang members will actually take the punishment because it's part of the thug lifestyle. Ghost Town spiraled out of control as the GD sets of the murder mob and the ghetto boys waged open warfare with rival gangs throughout 2001. Drive-by shootings became the norm, and residents found themselves caught in the middle. Milwaukee police, together with federal investigators, responded in March 2002 by arresting 16 members of the gang. Topping that list were leaders Jerry Bercy and Joel Rhodes. Indictments for the 16 ghetto boys included racketeering, drug trafficking, arson, kidnapping, and murder charges. After that day, for all intents and purposes, the violence stopped. However, the root of the GD violence remained. Ghost Town was as poor as ever, and joining a gang to sell drugs offered many young men a shot at survival. The crack epidemic fueled the fire, so to speak. The business of the gang was to make as much money through narcotics, and nothing was gonna stop them. Beginning in the late 1980s, the gangster disciples spread throughout the Midwest. They filled inner city neighborhoods with crack cocaine, leaving behind a path of destruction and decay. Eventually, gangsters like Stan Cole would expand even farther. Cole was part of a GD set called the Two Sevens, named after their hunting ground, 27th Street in Milwaukee. As a GD, Cole had proved his worth in street fights with rival gang members. Uh, a lot of times when it was time to, uh, to get into other gangs, I was the first one up to the plate to fight. So a lot of times it was just about set it up, be the first one to throw a punch or the first one to initiate something. It shows your, uh, your bravery. Cole had quickly moved on to selling drugs. I don't know what hit the scene first, the drugs or the movie Scarface, but when they both hit the scene together, it was a tremendous. The cocaine epidemic came in, it, it, it turned everything around. As the drug money soared in Milwaukee, so did the murder rate. In January 1986, Cole found himself close to becoming just another homicide statistic. With a gunshot wound to his abdomen after a drug deal gone bad, he fell unconscious and started flatlining. I was having nightmares of people pulling at me. I don't know which direction, heaven or hell, but a lot of them was pulling at me. I remember a nurse or a doctor standing over me rubbing the electrodes together trying to reach out my heart. The doctors resuscitated Cole, and he underwent massive surgery for the bullet lodged near his spine, but slipped into a coma. I got shot in January. I woke up in August. It was very dramatic for me, because I was like 220, solid, young guy. You know, and I woke up, I was 145 with a trach. 
Uh, a bullet can take a lot out of a person. Cole eventually made a full recovery. By then, his resolve had hardened. He vowed he would never drop his guard again. Instead, he would become the baddest, most violent, and most ruthless GD he could be. When you sit there in the hospital, you smell blood for, for months. It changed you. It made a huge difference in me psychologically because I had a shooter's mentality after that. Cole moved his drug operations down to Racine, a small city located between Milwaukee and Chicago. Many GDs had begun tapping into a virgin drug market here, much to the dismay of local authorities. They weren't even afraid of the police. The normal assumption is that if the police rolled through a neighborhood, that they would either stop their drug dealing or run away if they thought they were not these guys. They would just flash the gang signs and sort of wave at you and say, OK, challenge me. You try to catch me. We know what we're doing. We're in control. This is our neighborhood. Y'all out here racing bound. You know how we doing it, man. Racine police quickly ID'd the new thugs in town, including Stan Cole and brothers Norzell and Reginald Pittman. We knew that the Pittmans and uh, Stan Cole were pretty tough characters. They weren't afraid to um, shoot up an area, use guns, display guns, threaten people. It wasn't long before the Racine police caught up with the gangsters. June 1st, 1988. After midnight, a group of GDs accosted 29-year-old Dana Bostic as he left a bar in downtown Racine. They accused Bostic, an addict, of stealing drugs from them and promised to teach him a lesson. Bostic broke out running. The gangbangers unloaded several rounds of gunfire. The next morning, Bostic's body was found in an alley. Dana Bostic was probably one of the first um, murders in the city of Racine that was truly gang related. And you would think that little of Racine, Wisconsin was not that type of place where you would have people gunned down gangland style. Investigators tracked down eyewitnesses who identified the Pittman brothers and Stan Cole as suspects in the shooting. All three were arrested and charged with murder. Cole maintained his innocence, arguing that it had nothing to do with Bostick's death. The jury didn't buy it. In 1989, Stan Cole was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. It was unjust because at the time they was basically finding me guilty by association. I'm a GD, I be with GDs, I hang with GDs. Yeah, I'm a drug dealer, but in that particular case, I was not a murderer. Three years later, a judge declared a mistrial, ruling that prosecutors had withheld evidence from the defense. Rather than gamble on a new trial, Cole cut a plea deal, agreeing to serve six more years. After nearly a decade behind bars, Cole was ready to once again take on the streets of Milwaukee. Chicago, the birthplace of the gangster disciples. Even after Chairman Larry Hoover went to federal prison, the GDs still dominated the drug trade on the city's west and south sides. But the gang's culture has changed. The once tightly managed organization has splintered into neighborhood tribes. They may share the same name, GDB. but not the same unity. If you look at how many different uh, factions there are, there's basically a huge lack of loyalty within the Gangster Disciples. There's not that type of uh, closeness. Larry Hoover, the membership in today's day and age, they don't even know who he is. They don't even know what he looks like. Some former GDs doubt that the gang ever truly stood for brotherhood. As foot soldiers like Q grew older, 
they realized that it was all a charade. They try to, you know, embed in you that is unity and that is the love for your brothers, the means of brainwashing. If you think that I love you so much that I'll die for you, then you stupid. Q says that the GD's leaders recruited young kids for one thing, money. While gang leaders boasted about brotherhood, it was really all about bank. According to Q, an elite few pocketed the profits meant to benefit everyone. When I first seen it and I brought it to their attention, to quiet me up, they gave me a cut. You know what I'm saying? Hush money. Ever since then, I didn't have any more respect for the organization. They could care less about you. They will throw you aside when you are no longer useful. Inevitably, it just boils down to money. Nothing else matters. In 1999, former GD Stan Cole left prison a changed man. He returned to Milwaukee and began working in gang outreach. He opened a barbershop and hired teens to keep them off the streets. A lot of those people that work in my barbershop, nine times ten, if they weren't working with me, they probably try to be in your living room with a gun or something. So I'm helping, I'm trying to give back. And because of what I've been through and because of the path God put me on, I'm able to help more people. Despite going to prison and almost dying for his gangster lifestyle, Cole says he has no regrets about joining the GDs when he did. Being a 12-year-old, being homeless, those are the people that told me love, those are the people who fed me, those are the people who gave me a warm bed. I always remember that. You know, and now I reach out. I'm, I'm raising a lot of the GD's kids that, that, you know, that I grew up with. I share the burden to help raise these kids. It's really ironic. Now I have to get out and try to clean this shit up. Those trying to help Milwaukee's next generation of poor young black men face an uphill battle. In some areas of the city, despair is normative. If you talk to gang members, young people who are, let's say they're 14, 15, 16, and you ask them, where do you see yourself at 30? They laugh. They don't see themselves living to 30. It's killing season, Joe. The saga of the GDs continues, reaching far and wide. The gang is no longer just a Midwestern phenomenon. They've gone national. Authorities report that the GDs have expanded their drug and gun trafficking operations to more than 40 states. It's happening in Atlanta, North Carolina, Georgia, New York. I can't conceive that there's one state that you can talk to a law enforcement officer and they're not going to be aware of the gangster disciples. I talk to people that are in the process of venturing out to other parts of the country because they say it's sweet. It's getting crowded in Chicago. If you don't make any money, you gotta venture out. We're a powerful street gang. I see that for some time to come. And as any former GD will tell you, the allure of gangster life always produces the same results. Wherever it spreads, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Street soldiers believe that this is the easy way to make money, gain prestige, power, and control. But for the most part, they never make it. Somewhere along the line, they assault someone, or they beat up the wrong guy, or they get shot. They never make it. They're never successful. Either you're gonna spend the rest of your life in jail, or you're gonna be dead. And I can guarantee you that. Play that game, sink it from the beginning to the end. And it always ends the same way. Locked up. Or dead. 